Uh, well, hey, welcome this morning. Uh, glad you're at Manor House. If I've never met you, my name is Daryl. My wife and I have the great privilege of leading our church, and it's uh, an exciting time at Manor House. I just want to say, I think God's up to some really, really good stuff in our community. Can I hear an amen about that? Amen. Well, this morning, I, w- I want to pray. Um, I want to pray for the word. Um, we're going to talk about the church family table today, the church family table. That's where we're going to go here in just a few minutes. We're, we're in a series called Life at the Table, which um, I, I just have to say thank you to Pastor Ken, one of our elders, for preaching last week. Could you give Pastor Ken just an amazing uh, a hand for an amazing word on blessed, broken, and given, really the, the framework of, of, of Jesus' table and very specific moments in um, Jesus' interaction with his disciples that set the tone for really the church and the Christian life. We're going to dive in a little deeper to that today. We're going to look at Jesus' use of the word church and how that interplays with that moment at the table and how a model comes out of the table for us really to build a church family table. We're going to look at some doctrine today. I'm going to teach you a little bit. And and then in it, I think the Lord's going to inspire us. The Lord's going to challenge us. The Lord's going to move us as a church a little closer towards him today and I think closer to each other, and I think those are two good movements for the church, amen? Closer to God and closer to each other, and I think ultimately we'll end up closer to the world around us, which thank God for his placement in our lives right here in the Northwest. I I wanna pray this morning for my daughter Mariah. She's actually preaching up in Centralia right now at the church that I founded, and uh, I think that's really cool. She's gonna actually preach a word that um, Glenda knows well on Shama from the Old Testament, how to stand your ground in the midst of a battle. She's just gonna kinda tell her story, and I I just told her, hey, uh, I'm gonna pray for you this morning at church. So how many will just stand with me while we pray for my daughter? She preaches uh, the word of God today. I think it'll be good, and, and I think at the same time, God's gonna prepare our hearts to go to the word here. So Father, we thank you for your goodness today. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, to gather around the table here at Mana House. I pray, God, that you would be with us as we study your word. God, I pray that um, we would move beyond um, uh, just observation of your word into digestion and transformation by your word. I pray, God, that something powerful and transformative would take place here in this place today. God, I thank you for every person that's in the room and I pray also for my daughter today, God, for Mariah. I pray you'd anoint her, bless her, quicken her. Let the word of God uh, be sharp, active, and powerful in that place today as she preaches. God, use that horrific story where the devil tried to take her out. God, use that story to, uh, to take the devil out in Jesus' name. And I just pray, God, that your purpose would go forward there today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. Yeah, you can give God a big hand today, like just a faith, a faith hand. God, we're grateful for you. We're grateful for what you're doing in our lives. Well, uh, last week, um, I asked Pastor Ken to speak, um, and uh, my wife and I went down to Medford, Oregon, and, and spoke at a church called Joy Church down in Medford. Uh, that is a church that was planted out of here in the 1980s. And um, they've actually, in the last few years, planted, I think it's six churches out of uh, of that local church, down in La Paz and Wheaton, Illinois, and up the I-5 corridor. They've been planting churches. And uh, I just want you to know that um, when we stay together for the long haul, when we believe in what God is doing um, as a local community of faith, and we decide, you know what, God's planted me and I'm gonna flourish together and I'm gonna sit at this table. God will do a work generationally. And I don't know that um, Brother Dick saw everything in his mind's eye that's happening now, but I think if he were here, he'd be applauding the fact that the sons and daughters of this house are having sons and daughters and they're having sons and daughters and they're having sons and daughters. And really the world is being changed. And you might not know what you walked into here to today, but I got to see last week with my eyes a flourishing church that came out of this place that's planting churches. And I think we ought to just give God a big hand for what he's doing around the world today. Amen. So it was a real privilege to be there. But I'll tell you, the whole time I was gone, I was thinking, there's no place like home. I don't want to be gone from Manor House. I want to be home. So I've been itching to get back in the pulpit. So just put your seatbelt on, all right? Because I got a lot to say today. Well, um, I want to 
ask you to just open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 16. Um, I want to read a few verses and really, again, look at life at the table as the central practice in the life of Jesus and his church. We don't often consider life at the table as a spiritual practice. We consider prayer and worship, maybe fasting. But to look at life at the table as part of the spiritual life of the church, um, I think has has not been at the forefront of our thinking, especially, as I mentioned in the first week we were in this series, that um, culture has minimized action and activity in the family table. And um, while there's been a heightened awareness of food, it's come more with showmanship. It's come more with entertainment value rather than the transformative value of time at the table. And so we're trying in this series to really understand what the Bible says about the radically ordinary art and spiritual grace of hospitality, um, what table is really meant to look like, and why we see so much table activity from really Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation, and the centerpiece of eternity when we stand before the Lord is, is a table. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so you see table all through the scriptures. It's, it's just an important part of studying the word to heighten the things and bring awareness to and be, be formed by the things that are primary in scripture and allow those things to shape our life. That's what discipleship is really all about. So Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 19, I'm gonna read from the New Living Translation. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say? that the Son of Man is. Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. I think this is a snapshot of every culture and every era. Um, Jesus is asking, what is the confession of the generation that you're in? How do they relate? What's the central figure? How do they see me in relationship to the rest of their life? And if you can't, identify who Jesus is, then really the center axis point of your entire life is off. And the reason why he's looking for this revelation is because Jesus is trying to do something in the earth to recenter and reorient the earth. He said, but who do you say that I am? To Simon. Simon Peter answered, and he said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you're blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You didn't learn it from any human being. Now I say to you that you're Peter, which means rock. Now Simon uh, means reed. It's, it's, a, it's a flexible, bendable reed that sways with the wind and bends under pressure. You can't put a lot of strength into it. Simon was, was a, a man of chaotic character, but that day, because Simon had a revelation from the Father, Jesus said, I'm gonna change your name. You're not gonna be unstable anymore. You're actually gonna become stable. You're gonna be Peter. You're gonna be a rock. You're gonna be something that can be built upon. There's, there's, there's strength now that's being added to your life because of this revelation didn't come from any human being. I say to you, you're Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. We're going to clarify that. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Jesus used the word church for the first time in the New Testament. It's the word ecclesia. And he's describing now something that he's going to build. I mean, that he's going to establish in the earth to accomplish his purpose and mission, but it's something that flows out of revelation. It's something that flows out of God's work among humanity, and when they get a revelation of who Jesus is, something transforms in their life, causing them to move from unstable to stable and become a component and a part of something that Jesus is doing in the earth that connects heaven to earth. Like this verse, I don't know, a much more powerful verse in the Bible when it comes to human identity, placement, impact, mission, 
To actually understand who Jesus is brings you into something that he's building. And he used this word, ecclesia, the Greek word, it's, it's an assembly. It's a, a gathering of citizens, if you will, called out from their homes into some kind of a public space for deliberation and for government. It's a powerful word. It's, it's not only called out and assembled, but it has the essence within the word of a public council a, a sacred gathering or a legislative assembly. There's something so powerful in the word that Jesus is trying to de de define. He says, I, I, I'm gonna take this word that as it plays out in the first century, you're gonna see something profound about this group of people on earth that connects heaven and earth. Matthew 18 would be the second time Jesus would use the word, which we'll read in a little bit. And in it, he would teach the church how to walk in real life expressions of that church. Matthew 16, he'd give a large scale picture, but then Matthew 18, he'd talk about how to live it out in a local level. And so if all we had was Matthew 16, what we could discover about the church is that the church was important to Jesus. That, that's one thing that we could discover. Another thing is that we would understand enough about general terms to know that, that through the church, Jesus is establishing his kingdom government in the earth. So in general terms, we know that it's important and it has something to do with spiritual authority and government. Another thing that we could understand is that uh, we come into the church through an understanding and a revelation of who Jesus is. So these are all truths that we could understand but we wouldn't really know how to participate in it. We wouldn't know how it looks actually practically. As a matter of fact, we wouldn't really know unless he showed us what it was supposed to look like. The early church, it's kind of interesting, as they started to work out the outflow of Jesus' words in Matthew 16, we see distinctives of that church in Acts 2, and we have to ask ourselves a question. Where did they get those distinctives from? Where did they get their work? Where did they get the snapshot of gathering and eating at tables and the apostles' doctrine and the sharing of finances? Where did they see that modeled? And, and, and the reason I'm posing the question is, while Jesus said this in Matthew 16, he never built a local church. He declared he was gonna build the church. But what he did is he sat at a table with his disciples and, and then he, he died, was resurrected, taught them on the kingdom and said, I can't stay with you. I want you to take now what I've taught you and go build what I've said. I want you to go build it. Well, those apostles, after he stood and ascended into heaven. They were gazing upward, and the Bible says an angel came to him and said, don't stand here and gaze, go do the work. Go do the work. They could have said, what was the work? But they didn't. They said, we're gonna take what we saw Jesus do, and what he taught us, and what he modeled, and we're gonna put it into practice. We see that practice in Acts chapter two. Let me read this to you, Acts chapter two. Verse 42 to 47, it says, they devoted themselves. This is early church believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as anyone had need. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread again in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So here's the primary focus of everything I'm gonna say. I'm just giving you a little bit of a framework and here's the primary focus of what I want to say today is that Jesus declared his vision for the church by, by his teaching. But then he displayed his vision for the church at the table. 
Jesus actually declared his vision through his teaching, but then he modeled his vision for the church at the table. Jesus sat at a table on the night in which he was betrayed. He took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it. That was the framework of last week's message. But something about Jesus teaching the actions that surrounded it and everything that happened at the model of Passover, that table generated a culture in the church that actually was picked up by the early church and put into practice. And that practice formed the life of the New Testament church. The reason I'm taking us here today is because I think everything God has for us in the future is yes to advance Jesus' movement like happened in the early church daily. People were being added to the church. But it was added to the church because the believers became not only disciples, but disciples who made disciples. And as they lived their life, they lived it in a context of radically ordinary hospitality and life at the table. There was something about the church that was a place where people could find a home. And I want you to know something today. I think that Portland and the Northwest is crying out for a church who knows how to do life at the table. Life at the table as followers of Jesus because people need a family identity. So there's a couple things I wanna deal with in the next few minutes. I wanna deal with the fact that Jesus described his vision, first of all, for the church through his teaching, through his teaching, all right? That's the first thing I wanna look at is that Jesus described his vision for the church through his teaching. And there's two things that we learn from this. First of all, we learn that it was his church and in that it's his church, it's a church that would cover the whole globe. This is the first thing that we learn from his teaching in Matthew chapter 16. I don't think that we can, as local church, Jesus followers, love the house of God without having a passion for the nations of the world. I, I wanna just put that in you today because in this text in Matthew chapter 16, the word that Jesus used for the very first time church in, was, was, was where Simon confessed by revelation that Jesus is the Messiah and uh, his name would be changed to Peter. Many people think that the church would be built on Peter as the first apostle. Um, maybe even call him the Pope, if you will. Okay, so now you understand where I'm going with that, all right? So, so Peter, in some people's thinking, would have been the first Pope because he was the one personally who Jesus chose to build on. But the church is not built on Peter. The church is built on Jesus. And I'm gonna tell you why, what Jesus was saying about his global movement. Other passages all throughout the scriptures say that Jesus is the foundation of the church. As a matter of fact, one of them is in 1 Peter chapter two. I think Peter, um, even in writing his epistles to the church, needed to correct people's understanding. He wanted to make sure to set the, 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 um, the doctrine straight in the church. And so what he said is, by his own lips and his own pen and his own writing said, Jesus is the chief cornerstone of the church. Those were the words of Peter. And he said, you as followers are living stones that actually come and set on top of the chief cornerstone. He's the one that sets the order. He's the one that sets the model. He's the one who establishes what's up and down and left and right and north and south and east and west. He's the one by which the entire structure is framed. But you and I all participate. Um, the Greek construction of Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 16 even tells us when he said, um, uh, on this rock I'll build my church, he used a word that denotes like a, a center structure, a, a major, large, boulder type of rock. And then when he said, Peter, I'm gonna change your name to rock, he used a smaller word, petros, which is like a chip off the old block. You, you might represent the foundation stone, but you're not the foundation stone. You're a little rock that's put on the big rock. And so then Peter starts telling the church, you wanna know how this thing's being built? You're like living stones. You're, you're actually carved out of, of deadness and brought to life. How many are with me? told you I'm going to teach you some things, and then I think there's going to be some revelation that comes with it. When Peter chose to use the word living stone, 
he's actually taking a concept from stone, quarry, and, and masonry. Uh, it's, it's, it's a word that is reflective of the work done in deep caverns in stonework where you go down to a large stone and you say, I want to construct this building and I have a vision for the kind of stones that I need. So I'm going to go down into the quarry and I'm going to find a large piece of rock and I'm going to cut out of a large rock a smaller rock and I'll extract it from the large rock. And then I'll take that rock up to the building site and I'll place it. When it's in the quarry, it's called dead. When it's placed in the building, it's called alive. And so Peter says, you have been carved out of deadness. And you've been extracted from beneath the earth. You were dead and buried in your trespasses and sin. But somebody descended into the earth and extracted you from a dead place. Can I hear an amen? Doesn't that sound like Paul in Ephesians? Where the Bible says when, he died, when Christ died, he descended into the earth during the three days of his death. When he himself bodily was buried in a tomb, he was descending into the earth to extract you and I from our deadness and to carve us out of a dead, lifeless place and bring us above the earth and place us into his building, into his construction. And Christ is the one who sets now the order and the trajectory for our lives. Come on, you can clap for that. So Peter's telling the church, you're alive. You're alive. And, and your, your life and your purpose is found as you're placed in the body. I, I, I just want to be honest with you. I, I think that the the the, the message of the church in the West over the last number of years has become far too entertainment driven. And I believe in excellence and I believe in creativity and beauty and I believe in the power of, of everything that this generation has to offer as far as creativity before the Lord. But I'll tell you when you, when you detach creativity from the doctrine and revelation of members added to the house of God set like lively stones, finding their purpose connected to one another. When you just assemble to be entertained, it's not the church. When you assemble for placement, when you assemble to bear weight, when you assemble out of gratitude for being carved out of the earth and set into what he's doing in the earth, then you've become the church. Then you found your place in the body of Christ. Then you can truly be alive. Amen. Amen. Then you can truly be alive. When Jesus spoke in Matthew 16, he said, the reason, Peter, I can change your name and the reason why I can begin to use you to build is because you've had a revelation of Christ and what he's really doing in the earth. You're, you don't have the same sound as the rest of the culture, Peter. Some are saying, oh, Jesus is a good prophet. Oh, Jesus, yes, uh, he's healing some bodies and he's doing a good work and he taught us some good truth. In fact, if you follow his truth, you'll live a good, moral, probably prosperous life. That's a little bit of the story. He's so much more than that. He's the savior of the world. He is the builder of the church. He is the one that takes dead things and makes them alive. He's the Messiah. He's the son of God. He is light in the midst of darkness. Jesus is your redeemer. He is your savior. He's the prince of peace. Come on. He is the ruler of your soul. He's the healer of your bodies. He's the restorer of your mind. He's the one who will bring purpose to your life and add value to your future. He's the one that breaks the chains of darkness off of your life. Sin and addiction and disease have no place where Jesus is the Messiah. And where the revelation of his work is alive in the church. It's the first time Jesus used the word ecclesia. It's a well-known word from the Greek Old Testament. Up to this point, it was regularly used to describe 
the people of Israel gathered around God's glory as a special community. When it was used in the Old Testament, the Greek Old Testament, it was actually reflective of the people of God, the nation of Israel. So here's a key question. If Jesus took a word that was even utilized some in culture and people had some understanding, then why would Jesus claim that he would build God's community if God already had a community? That's a question we have to ask. Even more alarming, the Greek puts in this word an emphasis on the word my. Jesus said, I will build my church. Meaning there's an emphasis about to come on the scene here that's different then the way the word was used in the Old Testament, Israel simply pointed to what Jesus was going to do and now there's a claim to ownership. I'm gonna do something that's powerful, that's dynamic, it's marked by personal ownership and a relationship with Christ. It's my church, it's his church. It's a shocking claim, but what he was saying is, I'm gonna remake the people of God. It's no longer gonna be within the confines of one nation. I'm actually gonna bring all nations together in this thing that I'm about to build. It doesn't mean God doesn't have a special place still in his heart for the nation of Israel, but what it was saying and what he's saying is I have a passion for all nations. And I want you to know something today that if you're here and, and, uh, and, and, and you've wondered even because of your nationality, do I have a place in the body of Christ? Jesus was declaring, I'm taking that word and I'm gonna expand it to cover all the nations of the world. And what I'm gonna build is gonna be multi-ethnic. It's gonna be multicultural. It's gonna be a powerful movement that covers the whole earth. And it's mine. It's mine. He says, I'm gonna give that church authority. They're gonna grant access to people to enter the kingdom of God by the preaching of the gospel. It's the craziest thing that God would not only assemble the church, but then give them authority and say, as you carry this gospel of peace and you preach, you're gonna bring good news and people will repent through preaching. And I'm gonna confound the wisdom of the world through the foolishness of preaching. We have to ask ourselves the question sometimes whether we think that really what we do in the church and sending missionaries and planting churches, is it relevant? Is it worthy of our time and attention? Is the house of God valuable? And I want you to know Jesus himself constructed this thing and set it in order and said, I'm going to use it to cover the earth with my glory. Through preaching, and the proclamation of the gospel, the church would somehow bring the kingdom of God to the earth. This is a statement, it's got a lot of words, but I think it just says a lot, so I'm, I'm just gonna go with it. It says, Jesus came to reshape the covenant community of God around himself. The old community faltered and died in the wilderness, but this time the power of death wouldn't be able to stop it. Jesus came to build the church, the community of God. Can I hear an amen? amen? Come on, it's an international church. It's a church for all people. But then the second thing we learn is that his church would be then also a local family. It wouldn't just be a global movement. It would be expressed in a local family. A church is a local family. I want you to know, church, Manor House is a family. Maybe, maybe it's been a long time since you felt that way in a church. Maybe you've never felt that way. Maybe you've never experienced what true family is. But Jesus' second use of the word church in Matthew 18 is bold, it's powerful, and he starts to bring definition to what it was he inaugurated in Matthew 16. Listen to what he says, Matthew 18. If one of my followers sins against you, go and point out what was wrong. But do it in private just between the two of you. Can I, can I just tell you, this whole portion of scripture is about dealing with a sinning brother. Everybody say brother. The language is family language. And what we're gonna actually see here as we enter Matthew chapter 18 is how to handle relationships in the body where we start to see somebody is not hitting the mark with their life. They're actually stepping aside from the truths that they've been taught, the covenant community, the covenant way, 
And when it starts to impact you directly and the sins committed against you, what do you do with it? Do you put it on the prayer chain, whatever that is? Hey, just pray for my, my brother Jason here, you know. Jason, if, I, if he would just listen to me. Now, I, I know I'm not gossiping here. I'm just sharing my heart. I'm just venting a little bit. I'm just saying this so you would pray with me. Can I tell you, that kind of thing divides what Jesus is actually building Matthew 18 tells us how to handle relationships in the church because we want a family kind of relationship. If one of my followers sins against you, go and point out what was wrong, but do it in private just between the two of you. If we just do that one thing, church. If that person listens, you have won back a follower, but if that one refuses to listen, take it to one or two others. So scripture teaches that every complaint must be proven true by two or more witnesses. You know how many times... I have people come and say things to me about somebody, and I say, that's interesting. I'd like to dive into it a little bit, but, um, but I'm, not, I'm not totally sure that in every situation I can just take the mouth of, of, of one person. We, we've got to be cautious even about jumping on the bandwagons in a social media setting of just affirming what people post and what people say and get into the wave of cultural trends, just endorsing every rumor and every accusation that surfaces. I think the church is better than that. Can I hear an amen about that? The scriptures teach that every complaint must be proven true by two or more witnesses. If the follower refuses to listen to them, report the matter to the church. Second time that's used. Anyone who refuses to listen to the church must be treated like an unbeliever or a tax collector. He uses family language, brother and sister. He also tells us in this portion of scripture that people in the church will be imperfect and will sin. I think that the church as a family should be a safe space to struggle and sin. And James says that if a brother's over caught or, or, or caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual restore them in a spirit of gentleness, lest you also be caught in the same snare. I think the church should not only recognize there will be sin issues, but there should be a spirit of gentleness to restore. Can I hear an amen about that? So they're imperfect, they sin, but it, while, while we realize that we sin, we're passionate about holiness. We're accountable to one another and willing to be real and transparent even when things are difficult. We don't condemn one another or gossip, but we try to win back through gentle admonition in private first, in small groups second with patient counsel, and eventually, if the issue can't be resolved, taking it to a larger scale. The church should be known for its forgiveness, its patience, its mercy, its restoration, its process, and its commitment to family. This is the context of what Jesus is saying. Yet, if someone chooses to embrace sin and refuse to repent, the church actually is forced to recognize that that person can't become a genuine follower, can't continue as a genuine follower of Christ because it's dangerous for the leaven to leaven the whole lump. So that clearly defined community takes action and places somebody outside the context. What is this telling us? It actually can feel fairly disturbing. It actually presents the raw reality that the church community is made up of people who struggle with sin, relationships are priority, and things might get messy this side of eternity, and yes, there might even be pain and wounds in the church, but if we handle them well with a commitment to restoration and don't abandon Christ in the process, we can actually grow together even in the midst of pain and difficulty. I think people leave churches far too quickly in today's culture. We shop for mere entertainment and the reality is Christ is building something that's governmental, that's powerful, that's committed to each other. It's got leaders and people and saints and sin and mess. And the question is, do we deal with these things in an orderly way, in a way that pleases God with great care for each other? And if that's the case, then let's stick together for the long haul. And, and let's be in the family of God together for the sake of even at times 
Maybe I do something that's out of line and uh, I say something I shouldn't and, and I've got a, a brother that comes to my side and says, Daryl, I think you kind of crossed a line. Church on a global scale, you never get that kind of relationship. There's no way a brother in India can ever confront me for my sin in Portland. But when I attend a local church and I'm part of a family and I start to mess up in my life, thank God I'm known. And I've got Patrice who can come along and tap me on the shoulder and you've got the same. We need to be part of a family that calls us out, that challenges us, that we step up to the plate and we're actually concerned for our brothers and sisters. And we grieve the day if we actually have to discipline a member and it should cause us to weep because they're, they're a brother. They're a sister, they're like family. The number of times in today's culture we hear the statement, don't talk to me like that, I don't, you're, you're, not, my, you're not my Lord. Well, I'm not your Lord, but we're family. Like the, the church that Jesus is building, I think that's gonna be the powerful church. The powerful church that releases signs and wonders and miracles and casts out devils is a church it operates like family. It's got to look like the church that Jesus described. Here's another statement. It's, it's kind of lengthy, but just go with me. It says, against this dark velvet backdrop called church discipline, something bright and sparkly emerges. A loving, merciful, vulnerable family committed to holiness and grieved over sin. Christ invites us not only into the vision of his worldwide church that laughs in the face of death, but also to a family, a real family, requiring lots of forgiveness and vulnerability. Jesus then modeled this church by sitting at a table. And um, if all we had were Jesus teaching in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, we would know that Jesus is building his church and that it needed to have a local expression that looked like family. But we might not see it fully how it's supposed to feel and act. We actually might get a heavy hand. We, we, we might get confused as to how it should ultimately look and feel. So on the night, and I find it interesting that the text we read regularly tells us this, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. That's a little window into the kind of church that Jesus is gonna build. A window where we're gonna to have to deal with relational struggles at times. Jesus modeled his vision for a church at a table. He taught it in Matthew 16 and 18, but then he modeled it at a table. And everything that the church did flowed out of his teaching and out of his modeling. If all we had were the Great Commission, we would know that Jesus wanted to make disciples and baptize them, but we wouldn't know how the church was supposed to feel. So where did the church get the idea to gather regularly, to worship, to deal with the breaking of bread and fellowship and servanthood? How to handle one another in a family setting? He did it at the table. If Jesus hadn't said these words at the Lord's Supper, listen to this, the Lord's Supper, if Jesus had not said, do this often in remembrance of me, we might have known that we're supposed to be building something, but we would have no notion that it would even involve regular gatherings. So what he did at the table, communion at the table would make the church. It would become like a model for the church. The church doesn't baptize and have communion. The church then becomes a communion of baptized believers who gather together regularly to live out this great commission called the kingdom of heaven. When he said do this often, he was saying, I want you to meet together regularly. And I want you to do this perpetually until I come. And when he said do this, one of the uh, definitions of that word means to throw a feast. I want you to get together and break bread. 
I want you to get together and sit at a table like I'm sitting at a table. The idea is that what he was setting in order would become foundational for the church in its journey. At that table that night, last week, Ken used and placed emphasis on the blessing, the breaking, and the giving. But I want to come just a little higher and recognize a couple things, and this is where we're going to land, is that at the table there was communion. Communion was Jesus sharing in vulnerability and each other sharing in vulnerability. Not only was Jesus saying, I'm about to die and my body will be broken and my blood will be shed, but people were saying, oh, we don't, we don't, we don't want that. We, we want to share in this relationship. There was not only communion, there was fellowship. And by the way, there was teaching. I know that because John 14 to 16 tells us about it. The deepest, richest teaching of Jesus' life, unpacking the Trinity and the participation in it and the beauty. It all was unfolding on that night. Where did the early church get the model of meeting together and breaking bread? Because they saw Jesus do it. Sitting at a table over fellowship and sharing, they saw Jesus do it. Teaching and the apostles' doctrine because they saw Jesus teaching on that night. Centering ourselves around the gospel because Jesus himself said, this is the cup of the covenant in my blood. I Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, meaning the gospel in Christ would be the center Serving, why does the church serve one another and why do we step onto teams? Because on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he not only took bread, by the way, but he washed his disciples' feet. Jesus served on that night. Why do we pray together as a church? Because on that very day, Jesus not only gave thanks, but at the end of the Passover, he prayed for the disciples that they wouldn't lose heart. And he prayed, John 17, that the church would be one even as he and his father are one. The church should be marked with communion and fellowship and teaching and centrality on the gospel and servanthood and prayer and worship, by the way, because on that night, many times, even throughout Jesus' table ministry, at the end of a meal, they would sing a hymn together and worship. There was a sense of belonging and membership that night because as Jesus washed their feet, he said, you can't partake if you don't allow this to happen. There's got to be a share with him. There's got to be a stepping into the realm with him and allowing him to bring cleansing to our life. Jesus couldn't wash Judas' feet because Jesus didn't submit and surrender, and so he left the table. But the rest of the disciples were able to have their feet washed. Why am I telling you all this? Because our first exposure to what the church family table should look look like is the Lord's table. We discuss the Lord's table in terms of communion. Jason did this a little bit earlier, a cracker and juice. Yes, that's a part of it, but it's much more than that. The church is simply the family that's formed at a table. That bread and cracker reminds us of the centrality of the gospel, but it should lead us to communion. It should lead us to fellowship. It should lead us to teaching. It should lead us to servanthood. It should lead us to prayer. It should lead us to worship. It should lead us to belonging and a sense of connectedness where we say, this is my family. My feet are being washed and I will wash another's feet. And yes, when there's issues, we'll solve them internally. Why? Because we shouldn't think of the church family table as a different table, but as the horizontal aspect of the communion table. My relationship to you and you to me and us to each other is an outflow of the cracker and the juice. It's a statement that through Christ, we're placed into the wall in the building of what he's doing. And what Jesus launched on that night is something that's so profound that heaven and earth would shake. You find the apostles in the New Testament not only gathering the people in large gatherings, but commissioning them to meet in small gatherings. Because in large gatherings, you can teach and you can celebrate, but in small gatherings, you're accountable and you relate. 
If you're here and you attend, but you've never been in a small group, I encourage you to follow the model of the table and move into a small group. If you're not known in the church and you've never gone to starting point, I tell you, start, get into starting point, become a member. If you're not serving, find a place in the house of God and and begin to actively wash and care for somebody else in the house. Because Jesus not only formed the church through the table, but Jesus would carry out his vision through the table. The early church would set tables all over cities, breaking bread. And listen to what the Bible says in Acts 20, verse seven. And I want the band to come back. It says, on the first day of the week, Sunday, when they were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking. By the way, this is after Eutychus was resurrected. Um, He had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten after he talked with them a long time till daybreak. This This is Paul now gathering with the church weeks and months after uh, Jesus' table and the resurrection, what this verse is telling us is that they gathered regularly. And Paul was present and they, they gathered as if at a table to break bread so that Christ was the center. And uh, they did it regularly. It was the first day of the week. Not only that, the centerpiece of their gathering was communion. They always put Christ back at the center again. And around the breaking of the bread, Paul began to teach. And I love that verse because what it says is that he talked to them for a long time. My favorite verse for preaching. He just kept going. And everybody's wondering, does he know what time it is right now? Yes, I do. Daryl, what what am I supposed to do with this? What I'm asking Manor House to do is silence the noise of the culture around us and, and stop buying into the definition of what the church is supposed to be according to culture. And go back to Jesus' words and realize this is a a hub of power and authority. Portland can be transformed by people who begin to believe that heaven and earth touch where the people of God gather. But they don't just gather with no accountability and no authority. They don't just gather because they think, oh, God's doing a global work. Yeah, he is, but he's doing it through local congregations. And where local congregations gather in his name and become known like brothers and sisters. They gather and listen to the apostles' teaching. They put Christ back at the center. They worship together. They serve together. They have common mission. Then they go break and they meet in homes and coffee shops. They challenge one another and they stir one another on towards love and good works. They pray for one another in sickness and in challenging moments. And when a brother or sister has a need, they pull money out of their own pockets and hand it to them. There's a sharing of resources. And then at times, property sold and abundance of finance comes and they bring sums of money and lay them at the apostles' feet because the church goes forward through the giving This is all the snapshot of the early church. If if we can believe the Bible, we can stop feeling manipulated by culture and reacting to extremes and misuses that are out there. And we can embrace the real authentic power of God that flows through the people of God. I wanna tell you today, church, I, I am sorry on behalf of every leader who's misused the pulpits that they've stood in. And I apologize to you for for the brokenness maybe that's even impacted your own life from leaders who have mishandled their authority and and made you feel like, like a pawn in their scheme rather than a rock in God's scheme. Like I, I when I when I think about what's happened to the people of God, I grieve. And it causes me to long for the real thing. And something hit my life 
When I was 19 years old and I came and sat in college classes here and I got a revelation of Matthew 16, 18 and I said, I want to build what Jesus is building and I want to do what Jesus is doing in the earth. So everything I'm doing, Lord, I want to be part of it. You're building your church. Let me find my place on the wall. Oh, I don't have to be the leader. I can just serve. I can be anywhere, God, whatever you need me to do. I'm just part of your family. Lord, baptize us in humility. Baptize us in power. Baptize us, God, in a love for what you're doing in the earth. If you're here today and, and, and you have been wounded, I'm just gonna ask you to be honest. You've tried to find your place at a local church table and it's been a painful, wounding kind of experience because of misuse, abuse, and lack of health. If you've encountered that and it's causing you even to be reticent, I was speaking last week to some folks about this and a lady got so anxious, she got up and had to run out of the room. She said, it's just too painful. I wanna be honest to you today. I think the Lord is healing church hurt in these days. I think he's restoring his bride. I think he's raising up a powerful church in the earth. And I got a vision, man, a house to be that kind of a church. So even in the context of this message today, if you know you need to be healed, would you just stand to your feet? Be bold right now. Just stand to your feet. You know you need to be healed. You know you need the good shepherd to come and just touch your heart. There's some areas of woundedness and pain by the family of God and the people of God. Just stand to your feet. You know, I just need healing in this area. I'm carrying some leadership baggage. I'm carrying some woundedness. Come on, just be bold. There's people standing all over the room. Just go ahead and stand with them right now. Just stand. Man, wouldn't the good shepherd love to just pour grace on you right now? Come on, where, where there's some people standing, I want some others to go stand with them. Come on, just go stand with them right now. We're gonna pray a quick prayer and then we're gonna go back into a song of worship and I'm gonna want everybody to stand, okay? But I'm, we're just gonna pray right now. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. God, that your goodness, your, your gracious hand of mercy, God, right now would begin to heal hearts, begin to restore lives. God, what the enemy would try to do to take out fruitfulness and and blessing, and placement in the body of Christ. I, I pray right now that the enemy would be silenced. I pray that the word of God would begin to heal in Jesus' name. You said a word and healed. So I pray that your word even this morning would wash over these that are standing. And I pray that there would be a deep, rich and powerful healing in Jesus' name. And Lord, let the waters not only be healed in this house, but let them flow out into the streets, bringing Lord, a, 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 a very special, rich, crisp, vibrant, life-giving water. Life at the table to the city around us. God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your favor and your faithfulness in Jesus' name.